as realistic as a Rennie Harlan movie. Oh, it is a Rennie Harlan movie. I'm Justin. Fuck, you're fuck, you fucking fuck. I'm Sam, and this is fuck, I mean, Die Hard 2 on Stinker Madness. Die fucker. <laughs> Die harder. Die harder. Die harder. <laughs> Do I have to? <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't die hard enough the first try. <laughs> it's... It's dubious. <laughs> uh, okay, all right, all right. Uh, I'm Justin. This is Sam. Uh, this is Tigger Madness. Back to Die Hard. Um, the title, Die Hard. Now, I know before we go any further, yes, we're, we are broaching very beloved territory of uh, John McClane, the, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, but the title, let's, let's go back to Die Hard 1. Let's <laughs> start out in Die Hard. What does it mean? <laughs> What does it mean? Is it batteries for cars? <laughs> is John McClane dying hard? Or the is the bad guy dying? Who's dying hard? I don't know, but the term die hard is really in reference to people who sort of let out of date hobbies. They, they're die hards. They're right, not going to. Right. I don't I, think his that... hobby is killing people. <laughs> He's a real die hard. <laughs> He's a real murder diehard, that John McClane. A diehard, then. Just the words "diehard" sound like a command. Like I, I know that some, I who, whether it was McTiernan or some guy in a tie was like, "No, we're changing the title to Die Hard because it sounds tough." Is it possible to die soft? Yeah. <laughs> in your sleep. That's dying soft. What if yeah. what, what if you convulse while doing it? That seems seems hard. That's not good. <laughs> I mean, and technically everybody dies hard because of rigor mortis. What if they like got liquefied first? Ooh, oh yeah, uh, like John Amos does in this movie? Yes. He he didn't die hard, he died goopy. <laughs> he was probably the reason the plane blew up. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which we'll get to as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Die Hard 2 from 1990, uh, directed by Rennie Harlan, of course, starring Bruce Willis, uh, and a cavalcade of people that I like I've, that don't get lines. <laughs> yes. So we'll start with that uh, Bonnie Bedelia is Macaulay Culkin's uncle or aunt. Okay. Right. It'd be and, funny and if she was her uncle, but I'm guessing uh, Kieran Culkin's aunt. Yes, too, then. they're yeah. the same. Yeah. They're brothers, siblings, whatnot. Who I have to interject. I just started watching Succession. Sorry, late to the party. Holy shit, is it good. Wow, what a show. Go. I, I haven't gone to the party yet. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the people that we didn't see in... Uh, oh, also, Re Reginald Vell Johnson gets a scene right. because he was so popular in the mm -hmm. first one. And he, I guess, in real life, he was saying that... People still just put Twinkies in his cars because of Die Hard 1, and he was like, I was in Family Matters for nine goddamn seasons. He has a high school named after him, you sons of bitches. Uh, so coming new to the uh, party is first William Sadler's ass, and then the rest of William oh Sadler. God. Wow. William Atherton was in the first one, too. Mm -hmm. I forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, Dennis Franz. Yeah. Good fucking God. He said fuck... More than movies, like five movies that say fuck a lot will say fuck in this movie. He does. He is, it's just every word is fuck. He does, he, adjectives, nouns, verbs. It was a, it was an audition. Fuck the fuck, you fuck. <laughs> he was auditioning for network television, Sam. <laughs> you got to drop a bunch of F-bombs when you're, you know, trying to work for NBC. <laughs> <sighs> Did they? They said fucking, and that didn't. didn't I don't he, think did they he get did. to I, say fuck. I, I don't think they breached the f word because remember the South Park episode where it was like they said, sh "Oh, they're gonna say shit. They're gonna say shit on television this week." Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so Dennis Franz was probably the one that was like, "Oh shit." <laughs> I think that's what happened yeah like, well, i mean like, the joke in south park was hey you got some shit on your chin yeah well you can't <laughs> oh shit make it a big deal where like the whole production stops the camera tracks into him <laughs> and he turns slowly and says shit, shit. <laughs> there i said it 
<laughs> what are you going to do about it, huh? <laughs> oh. Robert Patrick was in this. Yes, he was. He got a line. Yep. And uh, so, did, so did Johnny Legs. So Leguizamo mm-hmm. uh, apparently had a much bigger part, but Ray didn't like him because he was too short. <laughs> So most of his lines got cut. Hey, who's saying those lines? I can't see them. I'm down here. <laughs> I didn't realize Johnny Legs was short. I thought he was like average height. He's fine. Yeah. There's no reason to cut Johnny Legs out of anything. Right. Uh, I guess Rennie Harlan must be like super tall. Huh. Weird. Actually, in the time that we've talked, Rennie Harlan has actually already knocked up three more of yes. Gina Davis's assistants. Yes. Franco fucking Nero. Franco Nero. Yeah, wow. What a what a. I'm not saying a, a, a bad cast, but what an unusual cast for a Joel Silver movie. Like, I I don't see it. Yeah, sure, Sean Connery, of course, but somebody who was not very famous in American cinema. Uh, no, and, and he had moved into the art scene completely. Mm-hmm. Like Franco was like. I'm only going to do foreign films. I'm taking my acting seriously to the point that Joel Silver like saw him in one of those movies. Like, I have to have Franco Nero, and people are like, "What? Oh, really?" And then he calls Franco Nero, and he's like, "I do not want to do this." No. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had a scheduling conflict. He's like, "It's okay. I got a scheduling conflict." Mm-hmm. So they made all these special circumstances and paid him normal scale, even though he had barely more the way that they shot it. He was only there for like a day or two. Yeah, right. And they had to make all sorts of concessions to get him in the movie. And no one, including himself, knows why. Right. Like you could have gotten basically anybody if you needed a name rather than just a body. You could have gotten basically anybody that was in that movie that we watched two weeks ago. The uh, the Jeff Goldblum movie. Uh uh well god now i already can't remember what it mad dog time like yeah. anybody out of that pool of people I, adam's family is 91 this. or 92 right uh yeah somewhere in there yeah i mean this is prime mc time, so right so this is really like they fucked raul julia out of a job yeah, by right. doing all this shit to get franco nero on because uh-huh. that's that's where he lives before uh the Adams family. Yeah, or or uh uh not John Lynch. Uh Richard Lynch. Get Richard Lynch to fill this role. He'll well, do it's, it. it's supposed to be Central American. Oh, which... Richard Lynch is is the man of a thousand faces. He That's he, true. You wake up what, what's your joke about uh uh John Hurt? Uh or Gary Oldman? Gary Oldman? Somebody yells cut and it turns out you were Richard Lynch this whole time. Yeah. <laughs> Said no one ever. <laughs> But I mean, seriously, if you're going to cut Johnny Legs and barely have Robert Patrick do anything, have Richard Lynch barely do anything. Yes. Like, I just don't get it. I I don't understand. There's a number of things that Joel Silver did that were puzzling. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of them is this is the first time that he gets almost fired from his own company. Oh, wow. Okay. Huh. So he reported the budget at 70 million. Okay. That seems fair. It was 40. He just decided to keep 30 meals for himself. Oh, no. That's embezzlement, <laughs> he also, bro. He also, I mean, there's, they. the talk about the budget is, is that the budget is like the way they charge to make the movie. The studio is basically charging them an hourly fee that's inflated for profit anyway. So the whole time the Hollywood system is already double dipping, but he tried to fucking triple dip, and he didn't try. He did. He triple dipped on this. Well, it and wouldn't just, be t- a, technically a triple dip. It would be a double dip squared. It's a double dip squared. He's, he's quadruple dipping. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, you're in trouble. And he's like, okay, I guess I'll only work on the movies that I want to work on. I'll be removed from day-to-day operations. Was I ever involved with day-to-day operations? No. I'm going to go make Lethal Weapon 3 now. Uh-huh. How much is that going to cost? Five $500 million. <laughs> uh Another fun, weird thing about this, besides the fact that Joel Silver, who would eventually get fired from his own company, I don't think he's made a movie since 2018. Um, his assistant, also, he got his assistant killed in Bora Bora. Oh, no. On what? They, Do you have any idea? Club drugs. She fell in a lagoon oh, and drowned. She oh. was she was all the, um, I think the coroner's report was that she was basically made of drugs at that point. Ooh. Grody. 
Yeah, and he was able to skirt the lawsuit somehow. He gave him, he settled out of court initially, but then the criminal charges came anyway, and he was exonerated, I guess. Huh. Um, but yeah, his career hasn't done much since that, and being fired for more of his shenanigans. Uh, yeah, embezzlement's probably more than a shenanigan. It's actually a he felony. didn't get they. I mean, from what I read, and I read, I had to do this in a couple of different places for a few days to see if there's really any paper trail on the money for this. And there isn't. Like, he got away with it. There's just no way to fucking prove. He's like, nope, it costs 70. <laughs> All the money's been spent. Sorry. Did you keep your receipts? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> so, apparently, Die Hard 1 mm -hmm. is based on the novel... Nothing Lasts Forever, okay. which is a sequel to the novel The Detective, mm. which was adapted into the film The Detective starring Frank Sinatra. So is Die Hard a sequel to The Detective? No. Okay. Because his name is Leland in The Detective. Mm. And even though Die Hard is directly what happens in... Uh, nothing lasts forever is what happens in Die Hard. They mm -hmm. changed the character's name to McLean. Okay. This is based on the novel 58 Minutes by Walter Wagner. In this, only Richard Thorpe, who wrote Nothing Lasts Forever, is credited with character creation. Interesting. Although, in the credits, they spelled his name wrong by adding an E. Oh, good. So... I'm pretty sure Walter Wagner got fucked on this deal. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. I thought it was interesting. I saw something in the IMDb trivia that uh, the country that Esperanza, uh, 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 Franco Nero's character is, or yeah. he's from, is a made-up country. And the only place that this made-up country has existed is in the movie Commando. It's yep. a shared well, universe. Also written... By Stephen E. D'Souza, who, if you look at his filmography, is all of those action movies from about that time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was writing all of Joel Silver's shit. Uh, and he's really dismissive in his comments when people are trying to do documentaries or write novels about, or not write books, uh, nonfiction books about this period in Hollywood. And they're like, well, holy shit, this guy was the one that was writing all the crap. And he's like, I know it's crap. Leave me alone. <laughs> do you know how much I made off that crap? Right. I'm still making off that crap. You can call it crap. You can do whatever. You can ask me some questions. I might answer them. But the second that we start calling me a schlock tour, I'm going to wander off. Yeah. So uh, who who wins in uh, a knife fight? Uh, John McClane or John Matrix? What I am discovering, and maybe it's the reason I don't like Die Hard movies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that John McClane would have make short work of the Terminator. Okay. In the John McClane universe, he is so outlandishly superhero mm -hmm. that there's no killing him. He dies too hard. <laughs> well, I've I've got uh, I've got an argument. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen John McClane use a knife. So uh, he's he's a gunman. Uh, whereas John Matrix, as we know, is a gun knife man. So he would use a knife gun, and uh, I don't think McClane would have any answers. Knife gun. <laughs> he's undie hard. He, he's die hardable. Die hardable. Yeah. He's die hardable. Yeah. So you can't kill him. Right. And in fact, he gets stabbed with a knife this, in this movie. So he it it can breach his skin. Bullets, however, uh, seem to be allergic to him. Yeah, they're a minor nuisance to uh, John McClane. Mm -hmm. And most people uh, in this film, at least, uh, shoot as if they were trained by the Empire. Because they can't hit shit. <laughs> no, no. Well, there is a scene where they're actually shooting with blanks. We'll get to that, though. That's true. Yeah. Um, so why do you think they picked Rennie Harley? Um, Harlan. Uh, I'm confused by that as well, because this is 1990. This is before basically everything. The only thing I this... know that he did before this was uh, Freddy, Five, or Freddy Ford, Dream Master. Yeah. Which I he did do one... like a lot, but for the wrong reasons. He did reasons. one directly before this hmm. the producers saw the dailies coming back from ford fairlane and they're like this harlan guy's the one that's going to be able to do die hard too wait i'm sorry ford fairlane 
yes. they saw the dailies for Ford Fairlane and were like, we need this guy in charge of one of our biggest cash cows that we could possibly imagine. Yep. The Ford Fairlane guy. That yeah. movie looks good. I want more. I want to see more of Ford Fairlane in a movie that's going to cost us 40 but really 70 because we're stealing money from ourselves. Uh, put Rennie in. God, are you serious? Ford Fairlane? I guess if you're going to steal $30 million from yourself, this is the guy that you want driving the boat yeah, where you pull true. that heist. Yeah, you don't want McTiernan doing it. No, McTiernan was going to do it, and it would have probably worked under McTiernan. Mm -hmm. I like McTiernan, and I like his movies, but I don't know if he's really as great as some of his work, because he was in charge of a lot of... This movie is a producer's movie. I mean, you got Yon DeBont shooting it. Mm -hmm. You got Stuart... Um, what is his name? Stuart Baird, who's directed a few films, executive decision being one of them. But if you look at this guy's editing career, I mean, this is the guy that edited The Omen, Tommy, and Superman. Okay. Uh, Could have. The director has a minimal impact in this sort of a production. Sure. So, sure. but he's but he's going to play ball. I don't know if McTiernan would have played ball. I don't think McTiernan would have played ball because here's where I'm at with Die Hard. I have only seen this movie once until now mm -hmm. because I didn't like it, no. and I didn't like the first Die Hard all that much. I think I may have seen it twice. I know that I've watched Die Hard 3 twice because when I saw Die Hard 3 at the theater, my leaving the first five minutes after that, like the first impression you get from the movie right after it's over was, I didn't hate this Die Hard movie. Uh -huh. So when it came on USA, my mom and I watched it again. And that was enough of it, though. Yeah. I was good. Yeah. I was like, yeah, this is better. So like McTiernan came back and did the third one. Mm -hmm. And really like pulled no punches and like did his goddamn best mm -hmm. and because it's diehard it can only be so good right interesting but yeah i would i he did have some integrity to him the mctiernan yeah i just wonder and, if if our if rennie harlan's entire career why we have rennie harlan is, is because this. of criminal embezzlement without criminal embezzlement would we have Rennie Harlan? That's just such a like, like a very Hollywoodish thing to say on this podcast. Yeah, like, God damn it. Because I, I mean, I just don't see it. The the Ford Fairlane stinks. It's a terrible movie. There's two jokes in there that I like. Yeah. Okay. Can you tell me any of them? Yeah. It. Uh, the way it's a line that's kind of a joke is talking to her was like masturbating with a cheeseburger slightly or. Masturbating with a cheese grater. Mm -hmm. See, I even fucked it up. Yeah. Talking to her was like masturbating with a cheese grater. Slightly amusing, but mostly painful. Right. Okay. All right. And I thought that was funny. And I'm, now that I said it out loud, I don't know that it's that funny. I don't know if it is. I mean, how would that even work? <laughs> the koala bear stuck on the fan was kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but probably not uh, something you see and go, oh, we've got to get him involved unless you're trying to cover up criminal embezzlement well Insane. also from a producer's standpoint getting back the dailies and being impressed with them mm -hmm. isn't necessarily more than look at how many pictures this guy puts out a day yeah because i'm not going to accuse rennie of going over time and going over budget he obviously took the reported budget down to like 40 mm -hmm. got it done in a small window this is two years after Die Hard was a hit right this was not guaranteed a sequel. So you're looking at a guy that works fast. Mm -hmm. So that's really what they got. And they, you know, they got that. Yeah. And he only had minimal. He liked the, he let uh, Willis ad lib his one lines because he thought they oh, were good. funny. Oh, good. So the comedic element that we get in this film is that if you were going to give one contribution that Rennie Harlan had to the Die Hard series in general, it would be that. Uh, McLean can be funnier and more snarky, which is making it worse. Yeah. Yeah, it's much worse. I I think if you take away the ad lib in this movie, I might think it's okay. But, dude, the corny lines are just... And they're 80 yard. Like, no. God, it sucks. Yeah, it was not 80 yard voiceover. Yeah, and there was... the one Another interesting thing about this movie is because of how foul the language is, mm -hmm. at one point, I think it was William Atherton, it could have been Sadler, one of the actors approached D'Souza and was like, 
can I can I change these lines? There's too many fucks in here. <laughs> and he's like, are you a uh, Boy Scout? What's your fucking problem? He's like, it's not that. <laughs> fucking asshole. I read this, and after I, I saw the word fuck um, for the 750th time, I actually started laughing hysterically. <laughs> I think this movie might play as a comedy. It says fuck so much. And he's like... You're right. We should get rid of some of these fucks. <laughs> they got rid of some of the fucks. <laughs> they toned them down. <laughs> uh, they censored their own fucks. <laughs> it still had too many fucks. <laughs> it still had too many fucks. It still is a comedy with the fucks. I think that that's actually the only thing that got me through this. Uh, I texted you when we were talking about when we were going to record, and I was like, every time one of the Tubi commercials comes up, I try to escape my office. <laughs> But then France shows up and the fuck train gets on, right. you know, full blast. And I'm like, okay, this fuck train's interesting anyway. <laughs> uh, fuck train, a sweet uh, German metal band. Love their third album. I believe it's probably a gay porn. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fuck train, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what the midnight meat train is? You know, you get on it and you bang. <laughs> Choo choo. <Just> <laughs> Clive, why? (laughs) Okay, Um, what else you got? Oh, that's pretty much. I mean, there's more. It's just not as interesting. Like Bruce Willis and Mel Gibson were both considered for Lethal Weapon and Die Hard. Mm -hmm. And it was like they were both being each other or being themselves so much when they it was offered. The Lethal Weapon was offered second to Gibson and Die Hard was offered second to Willis. Mm Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, to the first one, and yes, to the second one. And that's why Riggs is Gibson and McLean is Willis. Right. Yeah. I didn't like Bruce Willis until Pulp Fiction. And then that luster tarnished over the years. Because I'm just, I'm not big on him. No, I can't. I honestly can't think of a movie. I mean, he's a perfect fit for that movie. Uh, and I mean, that role. Uh, but I don't know. What about, um, uh, Moonstruck? Isn't he in Moonstruck? No, he's in Moonlighting. God damn it. The, it's the Bachelor Party. Bachelor Party? No. I don't know what movies Bruce Willis is in, because I just He's in a couple of comedies that are before Die Hard, where he's actually kind of amusing. Uh, I feel like Die Hard not only- uh, He was in Death Becomes Her. That's a fun movie. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I got nothing. But he's better at comedy. That's the yeah. thing. Like he's a, he's a silly guy. Yeah. And Die Hard has done two things. I feel like it is possibly because I'm so not big on Willis. It is possibly to find uh, you know sort of deprived us of a, a decent comedic actor. Mm-hmm. And two, it has given us more action from a guy that shouldn't be doing action than than. Any other actor that shouldn't be an action star. I, I would I would double stamp that. I agree with that completely. Uh, he has no business doing it. Uh, I'm sorry. And he, You see him in his interviews, and he seems like a very reasonable person. And he's obviously very soft-spoken, and he is not a very masculine interview. Uh, and he's doing it for cash. Mm-hmm. Like He's like, yeah, they keep paying me for these action movies, so I do them. Yep. Yeah, I, like, I have a blues band. That's what I like to do. <laughs> You guys want to talk about that? No. All right. Um, all right. Die Hard 2. Uh, die Harder. Uh, I'm going to skip over a lot of details here uh, to set the stage here because we're 25 minutes in and I'd rather just talk about the things that surround Die Hard 2. Uh, yeah. So if there's anything you want me to you want I to got go, some stuff here. Yeah. But, but here's, we, we should mention ahead. that Rennie really doesn't fuck about. Like, okay. This movie gets going with minimal setup. Yeah. So I will I will applaud him for that. Other than the exposition, I'm still pretty confused about what the whole plot of this movie is. I mean, I know what the, what the heist is about, but I don't really understand why it matters, and that's probably my arguably biggest beef that I was going to save to the end, is the stakes are so minuscule in this movie that I just kind of don't care. Um, but it, what we've got is an airport. Bruce is in town. Uh, uh, John McClane's in town in Washington, D.C. This is Dulles uh, to visit the in-laws. Holly Gennaro, she's flying in. They're still together uh, to spend Christmas together. Yay. Okay. So, uh, meanwhile, 
uh, we've got the Colonel, uh, uh, Colonel Stewart. Who... I, well, meanwhile, William Sadler's ass is practicing karate. Oh my god, when his reveal is fucking insane. It I is. bet he loves because he's a fun guy. Mm-hmm. Sadler's fun, and he knows that his career is what it is. Right. I bet he fucking loves that this is out there. He's like, remember me and Die Hard too? Yeah. 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 I was yeah. doing villainous stretching. <laughs> Naked. <laughs> Naked villainous stretching. <laughs> I'd also love when he uh when he he's, stuff is on the news and that's my biggest problem with the uh, with the exposition here is like everything all the stakes are informed us through us via cable news that's on TV not not uh, it's it's diegetic so it's almost background noise uh, yeah whereas so we're not really given the information that we need Sheila McCarty's character who she's a fairly decorated Canadian actress she's the reporter mm-hmm her character serves the only function is to tell the audience what's happening because the movie's really just right. a pile of action. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess so. Basically, the I think Esperanza Franco Nero's character is basically Pineapple Face, but they've captured him yes. and they're bringing him in for extradition uh, to lock him up at Gitmo. I'm assuming. They're they're flying him into Dulles. Is it going to take him to DC? Not right? get Mo. Yeah. They're going to no. Mm. <laughs> oh, no. Mm. Uh, what did they? I mean, they didn't even bring Noriega in. They just built him a compound and said, "As long as you stay in here, we won't we won't fuck with you too hard." Yeah. Right. Um. Well, that is also could be because he has the PP tapes. Um. Yeah. C- CR for one of our previous episodes. Um. But yeah, like, uh, what's what's uh, what's the Air Force? I can't remember uh, uh, that they fly they scramble jets out of in every movie in in Washington D.C. What's that one called? I don't know. Edwards? I think it's Edwards. No, Edwards is in California. I used to. Okay. I've been by there a couple times. I've watched an air show there. Yeah, I can't remember. Edwards is where they report out of in Independence Day. No, oh, that's why I'm thinking. Indep- well, that's because that's the de facto head of the government is is Edwards Air Force Base. Um. A- anyways, so yeah, no, they're not landing at Dulles. Are you kidding me? Uh, oh, we'll just do this prisoner exchange of a freaking <laughs> world leader. Are you kidding? No. Um. So he's coming in. Uh, he's a bad guy. Nobody likes him. Uh, the colonel. He is, I guess. A traitor to the United States because this guy is basically Castro and has been like, yes, I murder all of my citizens and steal all of their money, but communism is bad. (laughs) I feel like what we got here is that uh, Franco Nero is pineapple. He's Noriega Mm -hmm. and William Sadler is Ollie North gone rogue. Okay. Because this is supposedly ostentatiously about the Iran Contra affair in that whole period, even though it has nothing- ostentatiously, even though it's paper thin, and you can only discern that after sorting through the piles of action. Yeah. So either way, uh, Colonel and his team they're going to uh, p- for their their plan is to free Pineapple Face, uh, and, and so that's what our backdrop is here. So we've got risk in the air with Holly. We got risk on the ground with John. Uh, and here we go. So uh, the colonel and his team have taken over a church and set up basically a war room there. And this church is near the airport. And I guess as to where it's revealed later is that the, that when they built the new terminal, they moved stuff but they left their lines that are in the ground like their calm lines and their traffic controller lines that you could just you know cut into and splice in some wires and then get one of those screens that looks like a battleship board and suddenly you've got command of airplanes you they hijack the radio and you can't do that radio either transmits or it doesn't Uh uh-huh so they either shut it down and break it all the way and set up their own uh-huh or nothing. And the other problem with this whole scenario, Sam, is it's radio. They radio. The airport's not the only one that has radios. You can't just take over the airport and be like, "Ha ha ha, you can't talk to planes." I'm actually that guy with a big tower on top of his house. He's talking to us right now. 
There's a guy in the plane that they show in this movie that fucks with the radio. Uh huh. They will that has protocols for when the channel that they're supposed to be on isn't working to check the other channels and be like, oh guys, they're on channel seven now. Also, there's like fifty thousand airports around Dulles who could radio into the other planes at any point in time. The radios can talk or the planes can talk to each other. They have a blue line because that's the the branch of the service that comes even though Blue Line was replaced by Delta Force in the 70s, and that a movie called The Delta Force had already come out. What is but that? Blue Line do? has, oh. they have radio force fields. Oh, okay. <laughs> Delta Force doesn't have that, because they're not stupid. <laughs> oh, that's so dumb. Um, okay, so, they, so they're in this church. They've got command of uh, the control tower. Um they haven't launched their plan yet in full, but uh, they've got they've got one thing that they've got to do, and this is how John gets involved in the whole plot. Is he John's got bad guy sense apparently because he's in the airport lounge and he sees two guys and he's like, "Hey, they look like trouble." There's two guys sitting do we together sharing drinks. That's or we know that this is 1990, so they can't just be two gentlemen enjoying each other's company. Uh, that would be wrong. We don't have that in America. Um, so they're bad guys. I'm going to follow them. So he tails them. They're going into the baggage area and setting up their uh, their radio hijack device or whatever that apparently all of the central command tower lines run through the baggage claim area. Yes. Okay. Also, a man will be killed later by a device that I wrote down the name of as the baggage smasher. The baggage smasher. Yeah. John because they in, have. He starts fighting these those. guys. There's a shootout. Uh, at one point, John loses his gun because a piece of luggage falls on him and he's like i like this is your action guy a, a lady's bag fell on him and he's like oh my gun oh it's gone so now he's got to wrestle these guys which at one point involves him grabbing what i think is a can of hairspray and shooting it into the guy's face and he's like oh, i'm sticky <laughs> yeah aquanet in your eyes is no joke brother <laughs> oh don't touch my face oh no my hand stuck to it <laughs> Uh, so then this he... is superior hold. <laughs> so he, uh, so then he, he deals with the other guy. The other guy jumps on him and they both fall onto a, a conveyor belt and climb up. And at the top of it is the luggage smasher. They have those smash the belongings of the people that fly <laughs> airplanes and in airplanes, the baggage smasher, the baggage smasher. Ah, here's where your face goes. And he gets his face smashed. And, I mean, that's the only thing that this thing could do, is smash luggage. Yeah. <laughs> Which, now we're gonna... Because he, he... This thing doesn't have time to, like, talk about what just happened, really. Right. So they're already flash forward to Dennis Franz's office, mm -hmm. which is completely full of Fox. Mm -hmm. And... I feel like there's some words that aren't fuck here. There's like three or four of them that describe that it's okay for John McClane to shoot people because he's John McClane. Why are you shooting people in my airport? Fuck. Right. Right. Exactly. And John McClane's like, don't you see what's going on here? We got to shut this whole place down. He's like, and Dennis Franz is like, fuck you. And then John McClane storms out and on his way out, he turns and says, yeah, well, you got a lead button poo poo brains. <laughs> This is our hero. <laughs> okay, wait. Did you get to see? Because I was, I tried to do it, and I, Tubi was screwing with me too hard. I tried to watch the TV edit of this because the TV edit of this is renowned for how bad oh, the wow. voiceovers no, of the was foul language. I didn't know that was an option. Yeah, that's if I ever watch this movie again, it will be only for the TV edit because it is apparently ridiculous. Uh -huh, I bet. I bet. Yeah, in this scene, he, on his way out, he says, Hey, uh, Captain Lorenzo, tell me, when you go through the metal detector, which goes off? The lead in your ass or the shit in your brains? Zing. Yep. Blap. Shots fired. It's kind of funny. Did, so I think you should be doing comedy. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. He's got lead in his ass? Like, did somebody shoot him? 
in the butt. I don't know. And to shit set off metal detectors? I mean, I don't get the joke. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got a shit brain set. I got this metal detector. Of course we do. We got blue lines got radio force fields. Uh, that's why all the morons can only work at sky blue. <laughs> oh, uh, or jet blue. Sorry. Dang it. Jet blue. My, yeah. I fucked up my own joke. God damn it. Yeah, it's because they all got poo-poo brains. Yeah, I I thought that was so stupid. Um, okay, so he runs down to the dead body, the stiff, who's literally stiff, and gets his fingerprints uh, on a piece of paper. And uh, because Lorenzo's not going to do anything, he, he just thinks it was a big baggage thief um, who got his head smashed. And uh, he then calls Al and is like, Al, yeah. uh, I need these fingerprints ran. Get it, get it through the feds. Uh, state, federal, and try Interpol too. And Al's like, I work sure. the street, bud. I'm a beat cop. I don't have access to Interpol. I am not also, Jason Bourne. He faxes the fe- the fingerprints. He does. They make a positive ID by faxing fingerprints I- to the guy from Family Matters. I'm not sure if you uh, remember 1990, Sam, but uh, I dabbled in the fax machine there for a little bit. I had to work in an office and uh, we would receive faxes. And this was in uh, about the turn of the millennium that I was doing this. I couldn't read what the fax said 90% of the time into the year 2000. I can only imagine getting a fax of fingerprints and being like, run this. And they're just big globs. (laughs) You can't even see what they are. The greatest incarnation of the fax machine, its finest offering was a total pile of shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't think they run anything. But like Telex was better. Yeah. But people didn't like typing. They're like, oh, the fax machine, this works. You just just put it in there without having to type it out (laughs) and make it make sure that no one can read it. (laughs) Handwritten messages sent through bad photocopies. Fantastic. So Al's like, okay, so here's the deal. Uh, this guy's dead. And John McClane's like, yeah, I know. I just killed him. No, you didn't. He died two years ago. He was deep operative uh, special ops guy. And he got KIA'd two and a half years ago. So if you just killed him, something's going on. Something's fishy. And he's like, thanks, Al. Thanks for being in this movie. Goodbye. And hangs up. And- he doesn't. And it it starts a string of what I notice his behavior is socially unacceptable. And he's one of the rudest people I've ever experienced in film. Uh He never says bye. He just hangs up on people. He's a total dickhead to anybody that's at work or just minding their own business. Uh He's the biggest asshole I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah, he's not. He's not. uh, Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to hang out with John McClane. (laughs) No. (laughs) And then we find out in the Die Hard four that he's divorced you're like how did she make it through the third one right that she doesn't appear in uh i like this part because it seems like this scene is only set up because rennie was like giggle giggle snort snort fax machine uh okay guys how about this uh the lady at the counter she is like she thinks he's really hot and is like whoa you're like dreamy and stuff maybe we could go out for a date later and he's like just the facts, ma'am. Get it? Because he's a cop. And he's just, you know, guys? Yeah. Guys? That one isn't <laughs> a sterling example of why he should have been a comedian. <laughs> I think this is Rennie's joke. I think Rennie it's, wanted to do this. It's, somebody wanted to, and they, <laughs> they shouldn't have. The whole scene is just set up so that they can sneak Reginald Val Johnson in and say, just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> God damn it. All right, so he gets uh, the uh, the facts, the details uh, about this dead guy to the guy who's in charge of the airport. I don't know what his job title would be, but he's this actor is basically not Joe Don Baker, so I'm just going to call him oh. Joe Don Baker for the rest of the movie. Yeah, Fred Dalton Thompson. Okay, I would prefer Joe Don Baker. Get Joe Don in here. I like I like not Joe Don. That's okay. fine. Yeah, I think that Fred Dalton's had a better career. He might have. <laughs> yeah, he might have. Um, <laughs> so. Mitchell, um, <clears throat> he's like, hey, here, dude, check this guy out. And there, he's like, hmm, well, that seems fishy. But then Lorenzo's still like, fuck you, piece of shit, God, fucking son of a fuck, fuck, fucky shit, fucking 
with your fucking Who's facts. watching the fucking door with the fucking thing? The fucking guy's in here. What the fuck? So back at the church, the colonel, he uh, uh, he turns off the runway lights because that's something he's also jacked into. And the radars and the comms. And so control tower is completely down. Useless. The airplanes are flying blind. Did we ever see anything visually on how they did this? Because I don't think we did. Like, the the method to which they hijacked this control tower are not only dubious, but they're unseen. They are unseen. Well, there's one sequence where it seems like they've already jacked in, and also they're using that gizmo in the baggage room that seems like a big radio with an antenna on it. But there's one scene where they dig up the ground, and then they get out chainsaws and cut these big lines. But then I, you don't see them do anything with the lines. But you're also using radio and radio. The planes are being transmitted through radio and you've spliced into power lines. The, there, you either cut the power to the tower or not. The tower has power. It's a tower of power. God damn it. <laughs> tower of power. <laughs> yeah, they've also like the backup generators they've gotten. I mean, it's just none of this really makes any goddamn sense. But anyways, so now the planes are flying blind. Uh, they're all diverted, uh, except for the ones that are in uh, already in the landing zone, whatever that is. So now they're just told to circle. So now they've got like 15 planes flying over Dulles, burning up gasoline. Okay. Yeah, that's weird. There's like <laughs> 73 airports right around there. Right. I mean, <sighs> it's... It would be one thing if they did this in, say, like Salt Lake, where there's not a hundred. But I mean, honestly, Baltimore is right there. Bal- Baltimore's right there. Oh, I, even if you had to, like, you could fly up to JFK if you needed to. It's New Jersey, just Newark. Right there. There's, Newark. they're just right there. It's all. It's the East Coast, man. There's. It's made of airports. It's made of airports. <laughs> I mean, you can buy an airport over there for like nickels on the dollar. <laughs> yeah. They're swimming in them. Okay. Um, so there's there. He's like, okay, I've shut down your airplanes. Uh, what I want is I want Esperanza. I want him to land. I don't want the extradition thing to happen. Nobody comes near his airplane. And then we're going to pick him up and take him to another airport or another airplane that I want. Uh, it's a 747, uh, uh, the nice ones uh, with like the TVs in the headrest and stuff. I want that. And uh, fully filled with fuel. So get that ready for us. And if you do that, nothing bad is going to happen. Okay. So... This other guy in the tower, he's like, he hatches a plan. I want to get control of things back. Oh, uh, so I know. What? I retroactively figured something out. Oh, the chainsaw of the cable wires uh-huh. was to get the lights on the runways out. Okay, but they have a button that did something. They have a button to turn them off. Not they don't cut the lines and then the lights turn off. They, he says, "All right." Go and they start flicking but switches. I don't fucking no, know it how it works. And when they do that, they just have all the service vehicles of the airport uh-huh. line either side with the lights on. That's a pretty good call. And the engine running, and they just minimize the amount of runways they use. Yep. This is Dulles we're talking about. Uh-huh. They've got a bus that they can they can they can just go to Baltimore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my no. Okay. All right. So. uh I guess the only thing this movie has going for it and it's stupidness is that this was 1990 uh, and it's not like 9-11 had happened. And yes, obviously a lot of security, but there was hijackings throughout the entire eighties, like a lot of hijackings. Yeah. We sure we didn't have the TSA, but I don't even think you could bring a taser on board an airplane. And this old lady's got a damn taser. Oh yeah. You can't even then. And that, she tased her own dog. She tased her own dog. <laughs> That's fucked up. That lady's a bitch. <laughs> she likes torturing small animals. You might want to might want to keep an eye on this one. She might be late blooming as a as a Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So Burke, I guess is his name. Our guy. Uh. They are, they are building a new tarmac or a new terminal or something, and so now they've got. 
the, the, the antenna is already built. And if they could just get into that, well, then they could talk to everybody again. And on the well, John's getting kicked out. He overhears about this thing and he's like, OK, I got to get down there. So he uh, he climbs in through the elevator shaft and makes his way down to the sub levels of the airport where lives the janitor Marvin. Yeah, Marv's down there, who he's going to be in cahoots with for the rest of the movie. He lives down there, Sam. I guess being a janitor for Dulles doesn't pay really well because he's got basically an apartment underground. <laughs> he's probably just, you know, working it hard where he's like, yep, I've made this situation where I basically spend none of my own money. The second that I have enough money to leave this airport and never return, I will do so. <laughs> he's a mole man. <laughs> yeah. Marvin the Mole Man. He's that. He's the John Grease from uh, Real Genius. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Marvin tells him where to go about this Annex Skywalk. Like, oh, that's where it's at. He's got blueprints of the entire airport because he's a janitor. Um, and John's like, wow, that looks like that looks like a f- perfect place for an ambush. I got to get down there because they're going to ambush a technician. And they do, but the technician also goes there with gun guys. Like, who are these gun guys that he goes with? He grabs a bunch of gun guys. Hey, we got to go down on the skywalk. Okay, let's go down there. It's a trap. Robert Patrick's down there, shoots him. And then it's a big shootout. They get massacred. And then John busts in through the the uh, uh, air vents above and shoots Robert Patrick. He's dead. Robert Patrick got a line. I was really sad. I'm really sad all the time because of the amount of Robert Patrick that was out there in his prime. Mm -hmm. But I was like, why is he only? And I was like, oh, T2's next year. Right. Because I got to say that a lot in this, like my a few episodes ago when I was like, oh, T2 happens and people are like, oh, action movies don't have to be bullshit. Uh Because about four times I'm like, this is bullshit. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, T2 happens next year. Right, right. Because this is the biggest thing until T2. Yeah. Like, this made 240 worldwide or something like that. It made 117 domestic. Yeah, it's pretty good. And it only cost probably $28 million. (laughs) (laughs) Number keeps getting smaller. Okay. Uh, I like that John smashes a guy with scaffolding. He's, He's on his own scaffolding. And he gets smashed, crushed by it. Scaffolding is not very heavy because if it was, you wouldn't be able to erect it. Uh Um, Not only does a man die by getting crushed by scaffolding, that would be, he would hurt. Mm -hmm. He would have to take five if that landed on him like that. And he might crack a rib. He might have had to go to the hospital, but that's a maybe. No, he gets cut in half. He not only is a man killed by scaffolding. But John McClane himself is trapped underneath upwards of nine and a half pounds of scaffolding. Uh-huh. He is. And what's even stupider is that is he doesn't have his gun. There's a guy coming fo- right at him who has a gun. And John hits the button for the escalator, which brings his gun and the gun guy to him. And the gun guy's like, no, don't get that gun. And so he rushes him while holding a gun in front of a yeah. trapped man. <laughs> doesn't use it i can't because i don't want to go back and and i'm sure it's not but they look so similar there's two times in this movie where i feel like he kills that same guy (laughs) and then there's another two times where i'm pretty sure he kills another guy twice that's the same guy as he killed before i think he's gonna kill this guy again later but he definitely kills him right here why won't you die um then the antenna explodes so that they can't use that and uh, John gets one of their radios. Uh, oh, hey, we're going to do that thing from Die Hard 1 again. Oh, but this one's scrambled and you needed like a 10 digit code to punch it in so that you can hear anything on it. So I guess if your boss radios in, all you hear is like, and then you have to punch in a code and then go back to your boss and say, hey, um, could you run that by me again? Because you were scrambled and I didn't hear you. And then you stop talking to that guy and it becomes scrambled on its own. Like there's like a delay or something like, oh, if we haven't, you haven't talked to your boss in like five minutes, the scrambler comes. I don't get the scrambler. (laughs) 
Uh, <sighs> so he ra- the colonel he radios to the tower because he gets word that uh, all his men are shot up and that they tried to blow up or they tried to hack into the antenna and that was a no no. And he's like. Uh, Uh, So, yeah, you guys aren't cool uh, for doing that. That was a dumb move. And then John gets on the radio and he's like, you're poop face. This is stupid. I just killed a bunch of you guys. I'm throwing you. I'm throwing you some shade. And and the colonel's like, "Okay, I don't really like you, John McClane. Um, So uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell this plane that's trying to land to go ahead and land. But I'm going to change their altimeter to read that they're 200 feet higher than they actually are. And they're going to crash. He's going to change the report from the tower on the ground cap. So what happens next, because already a lot of the service vehicles have replaced the uh, lights that are out. Uh Right. Uh, They're all down there. The captain turns to the co-pilot and he's like, I'm getting a different reading on the our altitude from the tower. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he's like, all right, tower, looks like we're going to have to come in visually. And yeah. then they land the plane. Right. Uh, oh, oh, tower, uh, you're, you've got a misreported altitude here. It's over here on my uh, analog controlled uh, that cannot be hijacked by anybody that's not within the plane itself altimeter. Because altimeters on planes aren't linked to anything no they're it's just an altimeter. altimeters so that yeah pilot's a dumb shit <laughs> he's like uh tower you're gonna have to calibrate your ground cap uh, after we land i think you've got a few issues <laughs> temperature is 87 degrees <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if you look to the left you can actually see the washington monument uh, if you look to the right, I can see my house from here. <laughs> Love that joke. I uh, hope you enjoyed your time with Sky West. Wait a second. <laughs> That's not my truck. My fucking wife is a whore again. Oh, God damn it. Um, <laughs> so stupid. So this plane comes in. John's like, oh, shit. I got to get down there. So he bails out the window, does the escaping prisoner with the bed sheets maneuver to get down, uh, then lights two sticks on fire and starts waving down the plane. Plane's like, uh, if you look to your right, you'll see an asshole on the ground. Uh, we're going to go ahead and land this comfortably. <laughs> and flies right <laughs> over him. And he's like, shit, that didn't work. And the plane then... Gets clear of the fog, sees the runway right beneath them. It's co- oh, we didn't say that it's Cole Meany flying this plane. Yeah, it's Cole Meany. Yeah, I didn't even see him get a credit. Uh, this is pre TNG. His his name in the screenplay was Pilot Number One. Oh, nice. Yeah, sorry, Cole. <laughs> okay, so he uh, they crash. It starts skidding around, uh, and then the entire plane explodes. Because the plane, okay, oh my god, damn it! I I know that the masses don't know about this shit, or maybe don't even care. It's just a fun, stupid shoot 'em up movie. But in a situation like this, when the plane crashes, there isn't a safety or an unsafety device that floods the entire fuselage with jet fuel, so that it can also explode. As the wings explode, because what happens when a plane crashes is there's breakaway pieces like an airbag. The pl- the wings yeah. are the only things that have fuel in them. And so they break off immediately. And so you've just got this long penis skidding across the ground, which is a lot safer than having the entire fuselage filled with jet fuel yeah. so it can explode. That's designed to crumble tumble. Yep. It's the crumble tumble. Um. Yeah, when you're like, I don't know if people liked this because of T2, and this is the last big one that was stupid action movie. Mm-hmm. Because T2 happens next year, people stop liking this as much, but I know at least two people that hold this as the gold standard for theater-going experiences. Wow. Both of those two people I have heard, one of them was a family member, one of them was almost a family member, Um I have heard both of those two people also say this out loud. What's with those black bars? I paid for the whole damn TV. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Yep, that's who likes this. Actually, it's not, Sam. This has got a 7.1 on IMDb. It's shit. It got a 67 Metacritic score. I don't see it. (laughs) 
It's the gold standard for action movies until T2 happens after guess, this, right? I don't know. What the hell? Okay, so now John's pissed. All those people died. Um, and uh, Joe Don uh, tells John that uh, he's bringing in the army, that they've got a special team to deal with these types of situations, an anti-terrorist group uh, that uh, can handle it. Okay. And uh, also, your wife, uh, she's got 90 minutes to live, unless you do something about it, because she's running out of gas. That plane's coming down, buddy, so step on the gas. Okay. Good gas. She's got 90 minutes left, and they're not going to go to Baltimore. They could make it to fucking Florida. (laughs) Oh man. All right. So also we should at some point talk about Thornburg's little deal that uh William uh, Atherton's character from the first one, he's like a who are we gonna compare him to? Geraldo? I don't know. Yeah, he's Geraldo. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, he's just but... a little dickhead that wants to be famous for being where the action is. Yeah. He's okay. he's a slimy reporter yeah. versus a quality reporter. Right. Okay. Uh, he's pretty much the same character that he is in Ghostbusters with one of my favorite jokes, which is everything was fine until Dickless here shut down the power grid. And he goes, is that true? And Bill Murray <laughs> says, yes, it's true. That man has no dick. Uh-huh. That's great. It's a great joke. Uh, before we get past it. Nope, we already passed it. Never mind. Cool. All right, so Thornburg, he gets one of his sound guys, a guy that runs sound, to listen in with his. Hey, did you bring those listening in devices, or did you check? No, them? no, I'm that's not, not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't ever let somebody check them. I. That's not how it works at all. What he says is, "Do you have a radio?" And he goes, "Yeah." Do you know how radios work? And he's like, "Yeah." And this is movie will as long as the TV guy is using a radio. <laughs> And Other it, than that, it doesn't know how radios work. <laughs> the, the flight attendant's like, sir, I'm going to need you to turn off your radio during takeoff and landing. <laughs> He's like, no. <laughs> Why do you have a radio, sir? Like, uh, is it just, was it just hanging out in the, the seat back little compartment? <laughs> so he had a the audio broadcast directly to a receiver through radio. Uh, this is like one of the most well-explained things in the movie is how the TV guy gets to tap into the radio and it would actually work. But I don't know why this is the only well-explained thing in the whole fucking movie. Yeah, but I don't understand why he's got it. That's my beef. But uh, either way, so he, he listens in and he's like, all I hear is this beeping sound. It's like the tower doesn't even exist. And then Thornburg's like, what? There's a story here. So now he's got his story detector on. Um, but the tower has figured out a different way to broadcast to the planes, which doesn't even do it. I mean, they don't even do it. They oh. just do it. It just happens. Like, so now the planes aren't even a problem. Like, we can talk to the planes. Tell them to land someplace else. And they don't. <laughs> just keep circling. We got to get yeah. those people. We got to redirect them to their next flight. <laughs> they have to come through Dallas. Their bags are here. It would be rude. Later, <laughs> when under... Uh, investigation the con- congressional uh inquiry will discover that this was handled worse than enron yeah no shit no shit so john goes down to marvin and he uh helps uh listen in and marvin has one of the radios and so now he knows he can overhear he's back to die hard one but that doesn't even really pay off because he never really uses the radio for anything like he does in die hard one uh, listen, Hans, uh, none of that. Uh, but Esperanzo's plane is coming in and he, uh, he, it, Esperanzo takes over the plane. He fucks with his own escape. What are you doing, bud? He kills both of the pilots. Like, don't worry about it. Pilot. I can, I don't need anybody else. Just go with the flow, man. Let this pilot land the plane and you jump out and into a truck well, and drive off. We, we, because I'm going to have to sort of spoil. We actually discover, because we're going to have to talk about this. This, is, this, is, this thing is starting to not make a lot of sense. And by the end of it, it's going to make less. Mm-hmm. Because we learn that he can fly a plane. Sure. Later, yeah. we'll find out that the only reason they're rescuing him is so that he can fly a plane for them. Right. 
What the fuck is going on here? We w- anyway. We want to go with you. <laughs> no, I so, can handle it myself. Except for the fact that while he's taking over the cockpit and shoots both of the pilots, he manages to shoot out the window of the plane, so now he can't see. But that doesn't even matter matter because the plane's now been te- depressurized and he explodes. Yeah. He's dead. It was a C-130. You can fly those without pressure. I think he was pretty high up. It's a military there. craft. No, I don't know. I don't know. Either way, he's going to have a hard time landing because he can't see I, shit. I, I hope he gets sucked out the window butt first like that uh, alien in Alien Resurrection. <laughs> Beautiful butterfly. <laughs> okay. Mama. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> God, I can't wait till that comes streaming again so we can watch that movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, where are we? All right, so he's going to land. John overhears all this. So he runs underneath the tunnels to get to the runway. He almost gets ran over, and it's the stupidest thing on the planet because he's trying to get out of a manhole type thing, a grate, and the plane's coming in, and he's like, oh, no, i got to hurry up, but this manhole thing's too heavy. And then you get a reverse shot of the plane coming in, and it's going 10 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. It's so Austin powers <laughs> He's and also at this point watching the movie, I'm I'm very tense because it's got the op it's got reverse suspension. Uh-huh. A small part of me still believes that he can be killed right here, right? And I have hope that that plane will run him over and he will die. Uh-huh. But the it, the suspension is is not paid off because he escapes. Yep, he he gets out. He gets on the plane. Uh, he shoots the colonel in the shoulder it's like sit down and then uh, st- uh the other not the colonel esperanza he shoots esperanza and then the colonel and his goons come in and so now he doesn't have time and they start shooting at him and he dives into the cockpit trapping himself in there thus preventing esperanza from having a very comfortable escape when he could have just goddamn shot him movie over okay well no no there's more movie over though but either way they Sadler shows up, but they all spring the general who's been shot. Uh-huh. McLean's trapped in the front of the plane. Right. And they throw hand grenades in there. The slowest hand They're, grenades of all time. 37 seconds. Like, would you... I mean, I've never been in war. Uh, it's not something I've done, but uh, I've played some video games. <laughs> and uh, specifically, like, say, Halo. Halo. Uh, you want a pretty short fuse on grenades. Like, when you throw them, you want them to blow up pretty much when they hit the ground. Yeah, I don't know You're not waiting for what... guys to walk to the grenade. Hey, what's that? Yeah, like, I I don't know. I wasn't in the army, but I thought a 10-second fuse was standard on those. 10, ten seems and long. I would want a five. Cooking them was you flip it, count to five, and then chuck it. Okay, yeah. I, w- I, would, I would want about five. I don't want people t- that I'm throwing grenades at to be able to run away from you... them. No, you want the 10-second fuse for the pickle barrel. Mm. When you get it into the top of a tall thing and it has to trickle down to the bottom. Yeah. Oh, the, how so you blow it, up you, the Death Star. You, yeah, pretty much. You get you get the, uh, the the extra time you can cook off or you can every once in a while need a longer fuse. But these ones take too long. And they're also nuclear. Yeah, right. So... This movie is front end digital compositing. It's not the first, mm-hmm. but this was the the scene in the commercial. This is when the butts in the seats were at their warmest for the theater going experience. Was for this sequence in this shot uh-huh. right here. Yep, where he ejects. I guess you can do that out of a seven forty seven or C. It, it's C-130. a C one thirty. Yeah. Feel like you have to just I jump you just out hit the side. The roof. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you bail on one of these. I'll be honest. But he ejects uh-huh. and the grenades go off, and there's like the largest explosion ever. And some of the poorest aging special effects then come directly into your living room. It doesn't look as bad as Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> movie, it's aged poorly. A movie he did 10 years later. And uh, made somehow it look worse than this. because And this looks really bad. Uh, yeah, he parachutes out and, and, and Lynn lands. And the line that made me hate this movie forever then proceeds. 
Did, what about when he's flying in because it's a, it's just a static shot mm-hmm. shot from a tripod of him in a chair right. making the silliest faces uh-huh. while he's flying around f- fucking mega force style yeah yeah over an explosion and I'm just like oh my god this is this is one of the worst executed things I've ever seen it, in a big budget it's movie not enough. To make me want to turn off the movie, Sam, to be honest. But the next thing (laughs) is when he lands and immediately starts rolling around in the parachute and says to himself, where's the fucking door? And he doesn't even say it like, like, God damn it. I'm trapped in this thing and I don't have time for this bullshit. It's he is giving himself a moment of levity. (laughs) Where's the fucking door to himself, to himself. In a parachute. Because he doesn't understand how fabric works. Yeah, he gets, I, he's like, oh, I'm getting, I'm, I would be able to be netted. I am wanting. Nets work on me. Just saying it out loud has made my blood pressure go up because I hate oh. that line so much. And that he came back and did that through voiceover. Right. Ugh, God damn it. Okay, so. Then uh, Barnes, he gives uh, John a clue about where the colonel might be. He's like, hey, because of that thing that Justin said at the beginning of the podcast about where these guys are and where the reason is. They're in this church over here. So let's go check it out. Uh, They get to the church. John goes in. uh, His beeper goes off because Holly's calling him from an airplane, which I didn't even know was a thing really in 1990 that you could call from airplanes. But, you know, I didn't fly first class in 1990. I didn't even get on a commercial airplane until 97. So let's hold the phone. Okay. Why is the movie still on? Right? <laughs> Esperanza has escaped. No. They're dinking around. Why is... Why are they still... What's what's going on here? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there's not enough gas in the C-130 to get to a country that doesn't have extradition. I don't know what the closest that would be. Um, Bolivia? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the. I, I we, no, we have a extradition treaty with Russia. It's just kind of whether they want it's to play along with it. Whether or they not. want to play, then we're just as bad with them. Right. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I, I'm guessing South America, someplace down there. So maybe the C-130 can't get there, and so they got to get to the other plane, the 747 that they got filled up. They have a 747 filled up, mm-hmm. but even if why are they at the church? Why did you guys go back to the church? Why did you go back to the church? Why didn't you just go directly to the airport? We find out why, but it's not going to make a lot of sense. It's not going to make any so, sense. Uh, McLean has made his back- way back to Marv again. But then is this where he finds their? No, we're at the he church still has thing. their radio. We're at the church thing. Oh, yeah. So he's like, they're at the church. And then so Franz and John Amos show up. Right. They're right behind him. But not before uh, John kills the sentry by stabbing him with an eye icicle. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure this is the same guy that he killed on the the escalator walkie thing. But but I sickle. Yeah, I know it's come on. Dumb. <laughs> That's I thought the movie did it well enough. <laughs> no, I have to say it. Otherwise, it doesn't yeah. count. <laughs> Everybody, it's an eye sickle. <laughs> There's a hyphen after E Y E. It's an I. Yeah. Sickle. Sickle. Okay. So Amos shows up and Dennis Franz is like, what the fuck are you doing here? Mc, uh, McLean, what the fuck? And then John Amos turns to him and goes, hey, fuck off guy. You should fuck off. Right. <laughs> and so he's like, fine, I'll fuck off. And he does. And then he like, is like, yeah, I'm, I'm an asshole like you, McLean. And you're like, oh, I guess they're going to have a super, super team up here. The Blue Line, which is not Delta Force, and John McLean, who is a superhero of death and destruction. Also, in real life, there is still an open invitation mm-hmm. by John Amos for Bruce Willis to get his ass whipped. By John Amos. Yes. It is open. It is open. 
That was in my reading of the, about this movie. Apparently, Willis did some things on set that really pissed Amos off, and he's like, do it again. Please. <laughs> and that's where they're at to this day, is that John Amos is like, yeah, I will bust Bruce Willis' ass. He just needs to call me on the phone. I will come bust his ass. Fantastic. Yeah. I was. I just watched a, a movie about the making of Coming to America, and uh, John Amos gave an interview. He looks tough. He's an old guy. He still looks like we, he it, could whip Bruce Willis' ass. We, we saw how big he is yeah. in... Beastmaster is the only movie with it like really goes, hey, this is what John Amos can also do. He's a good actor, but this guy's fucking big. Apparently, he, his deal was that he got out. Like, he was from the streets. Like, John Amos yeah. is tough. He he got out from the streets, but he was in the streets. He was, John Amos will bust your ass. Yes, Sun Valley boy. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be catching um, my fist. Oh, that didn't work. Here's my fist. You'll be playing Catch harmonica him. with your farts because your <laughs> mouth will be too sore from my punches. Okay, so what they're doing at this church is they're rigging, they're setting up booby traps for their overriding airplanes devices so that if somebody tries to take control of the airplanes again, They'll be rigged to explode, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because your plot, as far as needing the airplanes, is over. But also, you don't have control of the airplanes anymore because they took over. They boosted the signal on that one thing that got explained briefly, and they told everybody to land. So, I guess I don't know why they go back to the church. I don't know why they go back to the church, but then we have an elaborate plan that is starting to get revealed that involves different colors of electrical tape. Right. Yeah. So they escape on, on snowmobiles and John sees them. He shoots one off like uh, like shooting a, a grunt off of a ghost and then you steal the ghost. And then he, yeah, I've been playing Halo lately. I know that's the second time I told, said yeah. about that, but that's what he does. And uh, he chases after him and they can't shoot. They, they all shoot at each other and they can't hit shit, even well, though he's driving right at him. It starts with a snowmobile machine gun joust with MP5s right. where nobody gets hit and you're like, man, this is stupid. You see sparks hitting some of the snowmobile. Like they've got some live ammunition or these are just how blanks are performing in the wild. No, because the but, guys are, that are shooting at him, Sam, are not John Amos's team. It's no. the Colonel. They do have live rounds. No, they didn't. They changed to the blue rounds in the church. They changed the blue rounds in the church. You're absolutely right. No, because well, he's coming at him. He does switch to the red rounds real quick. I did see that. Okay, and that hadn't maybe. been explained yet. But either way, they can't hit him. He jumps a semi truck. I don't know where that semi truck jumps come a semi truck. Where'd that thing go? I mean, you're where on a lake bed. Did it come from? Where did it go? The lake bed outside Dulles. Uh, <laughs> half of this movie is shot in the L.A. water treatment plant. <laughs> uh, what the? Th the semi. Mm -hmm. Why does he jump a semi? And the semi way. honks. <laughs> like it's. <ec> <laughs> I, I just you. got jumped by a snowmobile. I see uh, I'm not saying I'm homosexual, but I like the way you handle your ride. Is the Pork Chop Express is going to be talking about that over the CB for about two weeks. <laughs> and that's how we lost Large Marge. <laughs> <laughs> God rest your soul. Okay. So his snowmobile explodes, but he gets off of it in time. Uh, Colonel and his team, they ride off. And so now he's on to them. Uh, they, they call in, say, get the plane ready for Esperanza. But you were supposed to do that earlier. I'm not sure why we're calling you now and saying, hey, we're on our way to the plane. So Team Amos, uh, they're like, all right, boys, saddle up. Get in the van. We're going to go take him down. But they're not going to go take him down. It's a double cross. Amos was on Team colonel the whole time so why 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 would a real team have captured him like a real seal team six i don't see why not but they could be all bypassed you don't need john amos on this because you just go to the plane you just go just you don't even need the plane esperanza takes over his own plane and says i don't need you assholes i'm going away bye-bye this 
plan has 17 levels of redundancy. Right. That cause it to take so long that it's bound to fail. The only way that the plan could actually work is if there's a loose cannon, a, a, a wild card, you might say, named John McClane to bust it all up. That's the only way that this plan works is if there's John McClane. If there's John McClane and he's like, I'm going to, I got to keep fighting these guys. I feel like in the first Die Hard as well, about halfway through, you're like, I really think that if he does nothing, this hostage situation will resolve itself mostly peacefully. Mostly peacefully. Yeah. Um, no, because they rig the top of Nakatomi Tower to explode to mass their getaway. And, and oh. they're on a uh, they're on a clock as well. They're trying to bust into the safe. There's no clock here. Right. No, the clock is 90 minutes before the plane crashes. Yeah, but that's and he's not doing everything. That's what John yeah, he's doing. Every. Stop. Yeah, but John's doing everything in his power to keep that airport closed. Uh -huh, he sure is. Throughout this whole movie. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, John gets back to Marvin. I don't. I don't know why that's in my notes. Uh, that's not important. Um, Thornburg gets on the news because now he's overheard the whole thing. He calls into <laughs> CNN headquarters, like, "Hey, put me on." Uh, yes, this is Thornburg reporting live, Wolf. And uh, it turns out the plane's running out of gas. And that plane that exploded on the ground earlier, well, that was because of terrorists at the airport. And so now everybody should panic. And they all do. And they run out in the streets, thus slowing John from getting to his destination where L him and Lorenzo have finally come yeah. together. Uh, after John comes into his office and says, listen to me, man, those Navy SEAL guys are dirty. And Lorenzo's like, get the hell out of get the Get the fuck out of here. And then John shoots him with the blanks and then all of Lorenzo's guys that are standing around with their guns drawn shoot 50,000 rounds into John McClane and he's into dead. John McClane they shoot each other on accident it is a gun orgy right <laughs> and the congressional hearing later will find it to be worse than Waco um <laughs> boy this is a real pooch screw I gotta say <laughs> there's an Alec Baldwin joke in here too because yeah. of the proximity he's using those blanks right? on right yeah uh but I'm not going to tell it. No, I'm going to let you tell it to yourself out you there in did. podcast land. Yeah, there's no such things as as caps. Like the wad still the fly wad out. Still and... flies out. That's the only way a gun makes a gun like effect. Otherwise, it's clearly not a real gun. It's yeah. a pretend gun. Uh, all right, so they they get out in the streets, but they can't do anything because there's panic everywhere. And so John well, McClane sees a reporter, yeah. and he's like, "Oh, I'll go to her." The way that it plays out is that nobody shoots him. He sh doesn't shoot for it. And then Dennis is like, what the fuck? You're my fucking guy, McLean. Let's fucking go. <laughs> and then they get into a car and he's like, this is my fucking brother. And he's like, oh, shit, it's the guy that gave me the parking ticket. And then uh -huh. Dennis Fr Franz activates his police car and drives directly into a cab that was in front of him the whole time and goes, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, he does. Oh, man. Uh, meanwhile, back on the plane, Holly has gotten a hold of that damn taser and she tases Thornburg right while he's mid interview. But like, again, like, why is this necessary? Also, what do you think would happen if you tase somebody on a plane? I, How do you think the plane would like that? I don't know. Because there's a lot of very sense. Like, we are to believe that our cell phones can tamper with uh -huh. the sensitive equipment on an airplane. Right? A taser in an aluminum bathroom is. If unless his shoes are really good and he ne wasn't grounded on any part of that plane during the tase, mm -hmm. if he was touching anything metal when she did that, that bird's probably going down. Yep. Okay. Um, and also, just get it out of the movie because it's not relevant to anything. I hate this, like, oh, we got to do the same thing as Die Hard 1, but we're not really because we didn't really understand the point of Die Hard 1. Uh, we're just doing the same thing. Um, anyways, so team Colonel, they all board the 70, 747. Uh, but John's inbound on that news chopper. He's got a hold of that reporter that wanted to quote earlier. And now they're teamed up and he's on the news chopper and he's like, oh, get in front of him and stop. And the guy's like, dude, are you nuts? Uh, all right, well, get me over the wing. And so he jumps off and lands on the wing and Shatner goes, looks out the window and freaks out. And then and Shatner like, jumps oh, off fuck. the back of the plane because he's done with things out on the wings. <laughs> he's like, Franco Nero's like, shit, 
we're going to run out of runway. And then Sadler's <laughs> right. like, don't worry, this one's longer than the one in Fast 6. <laughs> uh, so he, he does, the one thing I did, like, here, okay, finally, something actually works in this movie. He takes off his jacket and jams it into the uh, Alarians so that the plane can't take off. Good. That's something that you could do. Maybe I don't know. Maybe, but in thought, it. Um. So I think really all you you, can't take off. You the way he put the jacket in is it's preventing it from going down. So I think that uh, Nero just needs to flap up, and then the air will just just push that right out. Maybe, maybe Maybe he can take off because I don't think that works either. I feel like he could have just lifted the flap and it would have fell fallen out. Yeah, probably. Maybe they're at max position already. Which why would you have your Alarians? No, you don't. Open. It's it it doesn't work. Just. It doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work out. I'm wrong. All right. So then John Amos comes out and they start fighting and John Amos loses. Uh, he gets kicked off the wing and straight into a, the jet becomes goo. And he, the thing's going about 10 miles an hour right now. Right. So he would have been able to just fall in front of that. Right. Yeah. And not yeah, get John, sucked in. John... And if he got sucked in to that turbine, that plane's no longer taking no, off. No, it sure is not. They crash from birds sometimes. Right. Yeah. And also, John gets kicked off the plane later at a much higher speed. Um, Whatever. So the colonel, uh, he jumps out. And, well, actually later, like right here. He fights him. He goes all karate style. John kind of gets his butt kicked, and he gets kicked off the plane. But as he's dangling from the engine, he manages to pull the emergency fuel dump valve. Yes. He opens the fuel dumper, Mm -hmm. and then William Sadler goes, General, can you overpressurize the fuel so that we can shoot enough out to be exploded later? He's like, check. Yep, check. Uh, Yes, you can overpressurize fuel in planes in this movie, I guess. (sighs) You'd have to really, moving at any speed leaking, it would have to be such an amount. You're looking at the whole of what's in that wing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they take off and John pulls out his lighter, says his cute little fun line and lights the jet fuel on fire, blazing a trail straight to the plane, which explodes in air. Yay. Yep. Oh, yippee ki yep. Mr. Carmen. <laughs> I think that's what he says in the TV edit. <laughs> And it's supposed to be, like, not their voices. Oh, yeah. Because everybody was involved was like, this made so much money that we can really tell all the other distribution to fuck off. If they want to put this on TBS, do it your fucking self. Right. And then TBS did. Yep. And so eventually I'll have to watch it because it's got to be awful. Oh, man. I, I, yippee ki Mr. <laughs> Mr. Carmen. Mr. Herman. Oop. Mr. Herman, you have a telephone call at the front desk. <laughs> Who is okay? Uh, so then now they've got a runway of jet fuel that's burning, and so all the planes come in and they land, and John's wandering around them. Holly, Holly, where are you, Holly? And he finds her, and he, then he bleeds all over, and she's like, "Oh God, gross!" And then Lorenzo tears up his parking ticket because it's Christmas. He's like. This your parking ticket? <laughs> Fuck it. Fucking. It's fucking Christmas. <laughs> and I write down, they mentioned Christmas. Yeah, they did. Because I thought I was on the hook there. Because this is my Christmas pick. Uh-huh. And it's set on Christmas Eve. But up until this point, I thought that they were going to make no mention of it at all. Because it just happened and it came out before Christmas. Therefore, it's a Christmas movie. Yep. And there's snow in it. Yep. But no, they made sure to... Make this a Christmas movie again. I, I don't know if it's a Christmas movie. Uh, it's not the rules. You can't just say Christmas in a movie and it's a Christmas movie. It doesn't work that way. Uh, but well, we'll apparently get... you can just say action and Michael Bay fills in the blanks and it's an action That's movie. Right. So yeah. okay. if you just say Christmas, it's a Christmas movie. <laughs> a lot of people think that. I disagree. We'll get to that later. Uh, first off, I'm going to go first. Uh, does their plane blow up? Does the lighting the fuel that's on the ground blow up their plane does he accomplish no. killing them no he does not i don't think that there's any way to push out a, that much fuel that would work with a lighter like that mm-hmm. if all the way to a plane taking off 
I don't think anything in this movie works other than if a guy in a plane had an adjustable frequency radio that he could listen to, that he would be able to listen to radio <laughs> on it. <laughs> well, I did some math, Sam. I did some research. Uh, the oh, yeah? uh, takeoff speed of a 747 is 200 miles per hour. The rate at which flame travels through fuel is 15 miles per hour. 15. The volume of fuel that you would also have to have mm-hmm. in order to make a flame rope, it just, the math doesn't it work doesn't out on any of work. it. That plane took off just fine. Hey, uh, we're losing fuel. Okay, well, I guess we're not going to make it to Bora Bora for that weird drug thing that we were talking about earlier. Uh, but we've still got another wing full of fuel. Yep. Let's get to, I don't know, you guys want to go to Hawaii? We can go to Hawaii. They can make it to, like, Cuba. That's where they're going anyway, probably. Probably. And back home. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. So, my first question. Mm-hmm. What was their goal? To get away. The terrorists. Because they the end, they say, now we'll be able to practice our way of life. Right, they do. They're just escaping what they feel to be political per- persecution of the United States. And they need this general because he can fly a plane. I feel like they could have just left. Right? I mean, I like the whole thing just doesn't make any sense to me um because again pineapple face springs himself and this is like i don't need you guys go home i like we're old bros because you're american military and i guess at some point you came down here and like your specialized operations team was sent to kill me, but you pulled a Hawkeye and you couldn't pull the trigger. And now we're all friends. And like, you guys are like, you guys are like my best friends. And if I'm going to escape persecution, (laughs) I want you to be there with me. I want us all to be together to say, screw communism, which is the basis of what the United States has been saying for the last 95 goddamn you what the hell <laughs> where are they going to a place where they can jack off outside you know, on each other or something I don't know. it's a ship all filled with men i don't know what way of life they're talking about either. it's very weird i just i'm yeah the movie vexes me and i don't know how people don't see it's not even that the plot is paper thin because there really isn't a plot at all it's just the motivations are non-existent the motivations yeah. are let's get ourselves killed by John McClane. Ugh. And John McClane is a a force of nature. Uh-huh. He's just a kill thing. Right. He's a thing that kills. He's, di- he's a killing diehard. <laughs> he's like a gun tornado. <laughs> he he will he's diehardening all over this thing. Okay. Well, I'm gonna move on. Um I've got a question. If you lived on an alien planet and uh their only mode of uh the only way uh, they're, they're rolling in giant eyeballs. They've just got an, a giant eyeball abundance. And so uh, they have replaced uh, the the wheels on their cars with eyeballs that roll really well. Would you call that an eye cycle? No. <laughs> what if the tires were made out of you? Would that be an eye cycle? Cycle. <laughs> okay, a real question. Does this movie capture uh, the true cr- spirit of Christmas? No. no. <laughs> it just says Christmas right before the credits roll. It's not a Christmas. To the point that like that next shot is it's like a first in Hollywood history, I guess. The shot at the end that the credits roll over after Dennis goes, It's Christmas, fuck <laughs> is the first time that they ever used digital co- compositing with a painted mat. Uh-huh. It actually looks okay. Yeah. It's not great, but it looks better than the other shit that they did in this movie. But it's like, among everything else, Rennie got a world's first on this pile of crap. Yeah. And the world's first is like, that's something we're keeping world's first on? Because whatever. I guess. It's the painting after Dennis Franz goes, fucking Christmas. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, it's not a Christmas movie. It doesn't capture the true spirit of Christmas or even make an attempt at it. It is not a Christmas movie. It is a movie that takes place during Christmas. Eat shit. Uh, Sam, you got anything else? Is the appeal of Die Hard dubious, idyllic justice at inf- at the cost of infinite collateral damage? Um, I can tell you what the... I don't know what the appeal is why Die Hard is a... Actually, I've got a couple theories. Um, people going back to the Christmas movie thing, uh, people call it a Christmas movie, even though it's not a Christmas movie, because I think they don't like Christmas movies and they're like, Oh God, if I have to freaking watch, uh, miracle on 34th street one more time. No, I now have an opportunity to watch a stupid action movie every Christmas. That's our family tradition. We're going to watch Die Hard. So that's why people watch Die Hard is because it's just a filler so that you don't have to see George Bailey anymore. Uh, that's why people like it. But but in 1990, I will give you one thing. Uh, it was uh, uh, a cinematic change as far as its protagonist because the ass kicking that John McClane gets in Die Hard One had never been. All of our yeah. action guys before that point were were bulletproof. You know the Chuck Norris, yes. the Schwazes, the Commandos. Um, and so him getting his butt kicked in that movie was a, whoa, that's, man, this guy's got it rough. Uh, but, like, yeah. the longevity, now that we've seen it a thousand times, I think it's just because people don't want to don't want to deal with their family. They want to drink a bunch of scotch and, and barf later rather than talk about yeah. what Christmas means to them. But the first Die Hard, as you're saying, there's real tension as well with the barefoot bullshit. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of really good things that happen in the first Die Hard. John McTiernan can, even though these are system movies, he sort of elevates them a bit, usually. Not later in his career, but earlier. This one isn't any of it. It doesn't no, have any of it. It doesn't he's have just any a, of it. He's just a murder tornado, and there's not even any cause for anyone to do anything other. The only person that has any justifications for their actions is Dennis Franz, because he just likes to say fuck that much. Right? And, and, like, the other thing about Die Hard 1 is, obviously... Alan Rickman is kind of a big deal. Uh, he's a pretty good, or was a pretty good actor. Um, kind of, kind of seals the show in that movie, in my opinion. Uh, oh yeah, there that doesn't exist in this movie. Again, there's no, there's too many villains. You've got Esperanza, you've got uh, K- Colonel Stewart, and you got John Amos's guy, and all of them have dubious uh, motivations, and the the stakes don't exist. They don't exist. Everybody just lands their airplanes at other airports and goes home. Oh. Yeah, and also we forgot to mention that they're like, oh, they can see the flames. The planes are landing at the end, and the one, the first one that lands just stops right Uh there. So there's like a 47 (laughs) plane pileup after everything else. They all fucking die anyway. Uh, Final recommendations. This is hard because I hate Die Hard, but this thing is so shitty. Yeah. It's so shitty. I think what I'm going to recommend is you're not going to get anything from the original version of the film that you wouldn't get from the muddy water that tur- the, the TV TBS edit was yeah. that you'll because there's not enough graphic violence to remove anything from the picture, really. So it's running times probably about the same. But it's going to be shittier because of the voiceover. So I think what I'm going to say is if you're going to do this, you should do it that way. Because I'm going to end up doing this again because I want to see how bad that is. I think that that's a good call because on just the straight laced 2B version, uh, the theatrical release, I'm out. I don't like Die Hard 2. I've never liked it. Um, I think it's a complete waste of time and it's two hours and four minutes long and it's too fucking long even if it was exciting. Uh, but yeah, this TBS how, version seems like cool. <laughs> yeah. How was it two hours long and nothing actually nothing happened? Nothing really happens. Yeah, dude. No, this is a don't for me. I'm sorry. Uh, I just don't like it. And if you've seen it, you've seen I, it. And I can't recommend it to you if you haven't. So do something else. Two don't sort of from us. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. I've got a little listener feedback this week. Uh, from our good friend on Patreon, and you can always subscribe to us on and support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash stinker madness. Chuck a buck our way. Uh, he says, This is Bodie Frog. Hello, this is Bodie Frog. We haven't heard from Bodie Frog in a while. 
Deep Blue Sea was the funniest episode since Dirty Dancing. I loved it, and my sore stomach was a small price to pay for listening to it. In this day and age, it's comforting to know that people still know how to have fun and be funny without disparaging anyone, except for maybe some actors, directors, writers, and producers of these <laughs> god-awful movies. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Bodie Frog. Uh, it's nice to always get uh, positive feedback. However, uh, I don't think... Like, yeah, I understand what he's saying about, you know, the internet being so toxic as it is. But the thing about what, again, we're trying to do is we made fun of Rennie Harlan pretty hard last week. Yeah. And Saffron Burroughs and Tom Jane and Samuel L. But here's the thing is I love all those people. I don't yes. have any animosity to any of them and what they are trying to do or and failing at. I think like, again, we're not making fun of people because we're wanting to take them down to make ourselves feeling better. We're making fun of them because we actually goddamn appreciate. Yeah. Them. We, our podcast might be Tom Jane's number one fans. <laughs> Or like, his we only. all love him so much. Or his OnlyFans. Yeah. In fact, have you gone to his OnlyFans webpage where he... Uh... <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> it's weird. It's really weird. He just he just knits. <laughs> why, why are you having an adult paywall for this, Tom? Or just, it's just a video yeah. of you watching, watching you knit. Yes, you don't have any pants on, but... <laughs> maybe, maybe he's like knitting cock hats or something. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. Anyways, no. The only person that we toss legitimate shade at that has any malicious intent, and we do it, is Tom Cruise. Yeah, it's Tom Cruise, but that's because he's an asshole, and so, and producers, um, because a lot of those dickheads. Well, try to I ruin think once careers. they when, once they get convicted of rape, they're sort of open game. Yeah, right? I agree with that. I agree with that. And people that commit uh, criminal embezzlement of their own goddamn company—that's pretty not cool. But I guess without it, we wouldn't we have. We didn't even really and... toss that much shade at Joel. We just kind of laughed about yeah. it, like, "Yeah, he's fucking got away with it." Right, right. So, uh, no, we love the people that make our bad movies. So, uh, keep making bad movies, people we love. Anyways, uh, next week, uh, Jackie will be back on the show. I forgot to mention that Jackie's not here this week because she's got the cold. Um, so her throat's all messed up, but, uh, it will be her pick next week. Uh, it will be another Christmas movie, but I don't know what it's going to be. So hang tight. Or it will be a Christmas movie because Die Hard 2 is not a Christmas right. movie. It will be a movie that takes place at Christmas. I will see. Uh, anyways, enjoy your week guys. Uh, thanks for listening and get to the chunk. Chunk.